Thank you very much, Fernando, uh, for those nice words. Uh, so our, our director is a very busy man. He's actually on his way to catch a plane. <laughs> so was, we're very thankful that he was able to take some time to talk to you about ICDP. So I, I wore the tie just to wake you up. Um, uh, any rate, actually, I'm known to wear loud ties. Uh, I won't spend too much time here because I want to bring up uh, Maria Calvo, one of our uh, directors, and she's going to introduce the rest. And so, Maria, I want you to come up, but uh, while Maria's here, um, I just want to emphasize a point. We emphasized it last week that uh, there, were, there's a lot of, there are a lot of experts here, uh, including Maria, who are going to help. They really have done a lot to prepare what's going to happen, and so I, I think we... I'd like to see you all come here on time. That means the morning lecture, so they don't come and see a half-empty house. It's very important that you're, that you're here. And uh, anyway, we'll keep emphasizing. I don't think we have to emphasize this. You know, last week was really incredible, as far as I understood. Everybody was, was uh, really there on time. And uh, well, anyway, there's probably another reason for that. It's this very special college this year. So anyway, here's Maria, and uh, she can introduce the, the program. So. Thank you very much, Joe. Good morning, everybody. My name is Maria Calvo. I am one of the co-directors of this Winter College of this year. And uh, just very briefly to let you explain that this is quite new as the director right now, Fernando Quevedo said. For many, many years, it is the first time that we are just organizing a college in which you're going to have hands-on activities. And all these hands-on activities are in the afternoon. But please don't get lost in the afternoon, okay? So just very kindly remind you that you are the guest of the ICDP. ICDP put a lot of effort just to organize this college. And we, of course, you just expect the best from us. And I think that is reciprocal which is expect the best from you. Uh, the idea is that you can have theoretical training that's going to be in the morning and experimental laboratory training that's going to be in the afternoon. Let me introduce the other co-directors. This college couldn't be possible because of this uh, special organization without the support of uh, the other three co-directors. So let me introduce you, Victor Lishuk. Please, Victor. Thank you, Nicoleta Tosa. Let me introduce you, Humberto Cabrera. Please identify, please identify Humberto because he is the responsible co-director of the labs. So uh, whatever you need to clarify, if there is something that you don't understand in terms of organization. As I say, don't get lost. We are here to interact with you. Do not forget that. So apart from being lectures, we really want to interact and we want to know your opinions just to be sure that the spirit of this college is fine and that we could continue on a future colleges. So we all are responsible for the success of this college this year. So that's all from my part. And now I introduce you, Humberto. He has to explain you something specifically about the organization of the lab. So please pay attention. Many thanks. Thank you, Maria, for the introduction. Good morning. As you know, this uh, Winter College is very particular because we will have uh, experiments in the afternoon, many experiments, around 15. Then we need very high level of organization. Then I encourage you to be on, on time in the experimental session. For that, I will explain every day the specific point because maybe we will have some change, but I will explain the same days there the same day, and please follow the organization of the groups. You must follow, you, you must be there with your groups at the experiment. If you have any doubt about this, please contact in advance. For today, we will have 
at four, a bay diffraction experiment in MLAB. And after that, we will have also optical lithography. Then you must be there in the, in the lobby 10 minutes before four, because we have to walk there to the lab. Then I also want to say that uh, the poster session will start uh, tomorrow. And if you have your poster ready, please, you can add around uh, this lecture uh, hall. You can add your poster because the evaluation committee will start uh, evaluation right uh, tomorrow. Then I think that's all. Uh, let's we study microscopy and to take advantage of the experimental session. If you have any comment or question, please, you can ask me or other directors, okay? Okay, we try there, Federica, the secretary, you can go there and we can organize this. Uh, and finally, I want to say also that the, uh, with the students of the preparatory school, we had uh, experimental session. And we had six students that I know very well to this group, but they will have with me additional experiment. We have to coordinate uh, with them, but I will contact, okay? And now I... Well, thank you very much, Humberto. So we'll continue every day. You'll get from Humberto the, the very last information about the organization of the college. And now it's for me a pleasure to introduce to you Professor Colin Shepard, who will deliver the first opening lecture. Professor Colin Shepard is a senior scientist at the Italian Institute of Technology in Genoa in Italy. Colin. Right, thank you very much, Maria. Okay, so it's very nice to be here. Uh, I, actually, this is not my first time at, at this Winter College. I was, uh, I think I was last here 16 years ago, or around that sort of time, so quite a long time ago. Uh, and, um, right, so um, I'm down to give lectures uh, today and tomorrow, uh, and um, actually the the the, the, the uh, the slides I've grouped actually into, into three files, and uh, I, I don't know whether you can actually download them. I'm not quite sure what's happened about these things yet. Uh, my, my files were too big to send by email, so, but, but I think they're, I'm they're yes. yes, good. Okay, so, um, but anyway, so I, I've, I've grouped them into, into three uh, files, uh, and I'll, I'll start uh, with the, I, I, I don't know how much of the second one I'll get through today, so we'll see how it goes. Um, now, so uh, Maria, uh, let me just explain a little. Uh, Mar Maria says, as you can see, that uh, I'm, I'm from Italy. I, I work in Italy in uh, the Italian Institute of Technology in Genoa. Uh, and, and I've been, been there for uh, four years now. Uh, and um, if you look on these various lists, I notice that some places I'm down as being Australian, some places I'm down as being British. Uh, it says, says British on my badge, but it says Australia on the thing. Uh, well, I'm both of those, but originally from, from the UK. And, uh, and then um, I, I worked in, in Sydney uh, for 15 years and uh, became a, an Australian citizen when I was there. Uh, and, but then subsequently moved to Singapore for nine years uh, and, uh, and now in Italy. And uh, so I'll introduce some of the things I've done in, in these different places as the talks go on. 
Um, so, um, but now in, in Italy. So the first uh, group of lectures are about microscope imaging. So I've heard that you've, you've um, a lot of you have done this uh, preliminary course and learned a lot about microscopes already. So I hope I'm not going to uh, cover too much that you already know. But uh, um, the other thing I ought to say, Maria made the point that um, we we like a lot of interaction in in this course. So. Um, please interrupt me at any point, and uh, I'd be pleased to, you know, to, to have some discussion. Uh, I'm going to be here for, for the next two weeks, so uh, you'll have plenty of time to ask me any questions uh, if you want more details about any of the things. Okay, so um, microscope. Uh, and uh, so here's a, a picture of a very nice, uh, this is not a modern microscope, you can see it's a beautiful brass thing. They don't make them like this anymore. Uh, but um, uh, on, the, on the left, I, I list here uh, the, the, the really what you might think of as the three important parts of a microscope. On the one hand, you've got the objective lens, you've got the eyepiece, where, how, the way you view the image, uh, and you've got the illumination system. Uh, and um, I put the objective lens first because actually that's really the most important part of a microscope. It's really the objective lens which is going to control uh, the resolution that you can get from that microscope. Uh, and uh, because of that, uh, very often the objective lens is also the most expensive part of the microscope. Uh, recently, uh, in our lab, uh, we, we had on loan two microscope objectives uh, from Olympus. These were special objectives designed uh, with a very long working distance so you could look deep into tissue. Uh, the purchase price of these lenses was 16,000 euros each. Right? So uh, I know you could buy a microscope for a lot less than that, but... Uh, uh, but this is just one micro microscope objective. You can easily pay that sort of money for it. So they, they, they can be very expensive. Uh, and uh, right, so um, last week I think you would have learnt uh, that um, the resolution of the microscope is determined primarily by the numerical aperture of the, of the, of the objective lens. So numerical aperture, N sine alpha. N is the refractive index of the... Uh, of the immersion uh, medium, uh, and alpha is the semi-angle of the lens. So the, the bigger the aperture of the lens, uh, the better uh, resolution you'll get. Of course, the, um, the resolution also depends on the wavelength of the light, and uh, we'll talk about that later. Um, but I'm going to say a bit more about the objective lens uh, so, so that you know uh, that it's very important you, you choose the right lens for the right thing. And um, so you can, uh, you, you, you can get air, air objectives, oil immersion objectives. Um, water immersion objectives are becoming more and more popular uh, as people want to uh, look in, into biological tissue. You want to focus deep into the, into the tissue. Uh, and um, water is quite a good refractive index match uh, to many uh, tissues. So uh, th this is the, why, the reason we're going in that direction. Um, but when it comes to resolution, of course, you want this, uh, the refractive index to be as high as possible. Uh, and uh, so oil has got a refractive index which is pretty close to that of glass. So... Um, 1.514, I think, is the, what the, the standard uh, for the refractive index of, of oil. Um, I might add that another th a feature that um, we, we sometimes find in experiments, in sensitive experiments, uh, is that the refractive index of oil depends quite strongly on temperature. Uh, and uh, so be aware of that. Um, if, you, if your lab is very hot, you'll find that the... the, the um, Refractive index of the oil is not what you think it's going to be, perhaps. Okay, uh, and then um, objective lenses are, are corrected uh, for a cover slip or maybe not corrected for a cover slip. So typically, uh, lenses that are designed to look at metallographic specimens, surfaces, 
uh, are not corrected for a cover slip, but, uh, but if you, um, for bi biological systems, usually they are. Uh, and, uh, and they're corrected for a particular thickness of cover slip. Uh, the, the standard is what's called a number one and a half. Uh, so they, they range through different numbers, starting from one is the thinnest. Uh, but one and a half is the most standard, and it's um, 170 microns thick. Uh, you'll find uh, that uh, sometimes they vary in thickness. If you buy good quality ones from Zeiss or someone, you, you probably can uh, rely on them being pretty well what they say they are. If you buy cheap ones, you'll find that they vary a fair bit. So you may be a good idea to check them with a micrometer to make sure that you've got the right thickness. So uh, changing these things, the, the, uh, the, the immersion fluid and the cover slip, uh, are going to change the aberrations of the lens. So the, the lens is corrected to work with a particular thickness of cover slip, a particular immersion fluid, and so on. Um, now, the other thing is um, what happens on the other side of the objective. Uh, nowadays, most objectives are, are corrected for infinity. They bring, a, they bring, they focus to produce an image at infinity. Uh, this, this has actually only happened over the last, uh, uh, I'm not really quite sure now, 10 or 20 years, let's say. Uh, before that, uh, most, uh, most uh, microscoped objectives were designed to bring a, the, a, an image somewhere inside the tube of the microscope. So typically it would have been 160 uh, millimeters or something like that. Uh, in those days, virtually every manufacturer had their uh, own standards for this. So 160, 170, 210, pretty well every company, they, they did different things. Nowadays, people have um, uh, standardized or on uh, correcting for infinity, uh, but the, the way that they're, they're corrected does vary, and uh, you have to be aware of that too. Uh, Zeiss objectives, for, for example, uh, are corrected so that um, some of the final chromatic cor correction is done by the, by the eyepiece, right? So the lens itself is not completely achromatic. Uh, so if you, use, uh, if, if you use that sort of lens, uh, then you have to, well, you, you use it with a tube lens, which, which is going to, the, the combination uh, will produce a, an achromatic effect. So that's basically... Uh, why you have to be careful of these things. Um, so uh, you can't just take different components from different manufacturers and think that they're going to work well when they go together. Okay, and uh, so then finally on the objective lens, if you read, if you look on the objective lens, you'll find something like this. So this tells you all the information. 100 times magnification, uh, 1.4 numerical aperture, oil immersion, 0.17 means the thickness of the cover slip, infinity is, is for where it brings its image. Uh, and uh, so all that information is written on the objective. Okay, now, so a bit more about resolution. Uh, you, you remember there's this thing called the airy disk. Uh, this is a picture I took from Born and Wolf. Um, the, the sort of standard book on uh, optics. Got lots of good information in there, uh, but I'm, not, I'm sure that you, it, people who've looked in it realize it's not actually a very good book for beginners to learn optics from. It's, uh, it's definitely a serious book uh, for people who are experts, really. Uh, but anyway, this is an experimental picture of an airy disk, uh, and uh, the airy disk is the image of a point object. If you have a let's say a metallic screen with a small hole in it, very small hole, uh, then you get, look at an image of that in your microscope, of course, because of diffraction effects, uh, you, will, you won't see a point, you'll see some blur, uh, and this is what it would look like. You see a central, central bright spot surrounded by a series of, of rings. Uh, so now, this is photographed from an experiment, uh, but note that um, actually, you know, when they've taken this photograph, it's overexposed. If you, if you look at it with your eye, uh, you, wouldn't see, you wouldn't be able to notice as many rings as this because they, they become weak quite quickly. So this has actually been overexposed, so this central lobe is, is, is saturated 
so that you can see these outer rings. This is a cross-section uh, through this picture. Uh, and um, now the interesting thing uh, is that uh, the whole idea of the numerical aperture uh, and you know the, the size of this spot is going to depend on the numerical aperture and also the wavelength. Uh, but the shape of this curve is the same. It doesn't, it doesn't depend on the numerical aperture or the wavelength. Uh, and so we plot this uh, against this normalized quantity. Uh, this is what's called the optical coordinate. If you look in Born and Wolf, I think this is probably where it was first defined. Uh, v is the optical coordinate. It's a dimensionless quantity, uh, a dimensionless distance, if you like, uh, and it's defined like this. Uh, there's a, I missed out, a, sorry, there should, should be an R in here. It's a normalized radius. Uh, so it's the radius multiplied by uh, 2 pi over lambda, which is K, the, the wave number, uh, and multiplied by N sine alpha, the numerical aperture. Right. So if you plot this curve against this normalized quantity V, uh, then the same curve is going to apply for any system. Uh, and, uh, and this is what it looks like. Uh, it turns out that uh, you can express this term in terms of uh, Bessel functions mathematically. The amplitude is given by this thing. Uh, and um, so the intensity, uh, as I've plotted here, is the modular square of this. Uh, and the reason why we put this 2 there uh, is to make it so that th this thing becomes 1 when v equals 0. So here it's plotted. Here you can see it's got a normalized intensity of 1 <coughs> when v equals 0. Uh, so this is a Bessel function, j1. Uh, and um, for people who might feel frightened by Bessel functions, Bessel function is really nothing more than a it's, 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 it's very similar to a cosine. It's very similar to a decaying cosine wave, except that the zeros are not regularly spaced as, as they would be for a cosine wave. Right? So it's, it's nothing uh, to, to be uh, afraid of. OK, so that's the image of one point. What happens now if we look at the image of two points? Uh, and um, this was um, uh, a... Uh, Criterion of resolution that was introduced uh, by Lord Rayleigh. Uh, so this is one of the two major ways that you specify the resolution of a microscope. One way is in terms of Rayleigh's criterion for two-point resolution. Uh, the other way is Abba's uh, resolution limit, and I'll go on to that in a minute. Uh, but um, actually, uh, um, historically, Abba's was before Rayleigh's. Right? Ray Rayleigh's was about, I think, six years after Abba's um, uh, criterion was introduced. Uh, so Rayleigh said, yes, well, OK, um, if, if, you've got the, if you're looking at the image of two points, uh, then uh, you can see, um, if, they are, if they're well separated, you can see there are two points there. If they're too close together, you're not really sure. Is, there, is this really two points, or is it just one sort of slightly elongated point or slightly elongated region, right? So uh, he came up with this idea, uh, uh, this um, uh, criterion, uh, and he said that, um, that, that the points are just resolved, um, if I go back to the previous slide, if you place the, the second point over the first, the dark ring of the first one. So if you place it here, then we, we'll say they are resolved. If they're closer together than that, we say that they're not resolved. Very arbitrary, really. Uh, it, it's not that you know, anything magic happens at that figure. Uh, it's just around there that, that things happen. OK, this is what I've just said. Two points are just resolved if the second point is placed on the first dart ring of the first point. Uh, and if you, if you do that, uh, then you find that this is what the separation is. Uh, the value of this V, or rather 2V, is equal to 3.84, uh, if, if that is, uh, condition is achieved. Uh, th this is basically uh, the first zero of the Bessel function J1. Uh, and um, 
So 0.61 is a figure that you maybe have come across, it often comes up in uh, you know, diffraction experiments and so on as the spacing between things. Uh, and, um, or even sometimes you see uh, twice this figure, 1.22, as being a magic number that comes up to do with diffraction by circular aperture. Uh, so this is, you know, Rayleigh recognized that this was rather an arbitrary uh, concept. This rule is convenient on account of its simplicity, and it is sufficiently accurate in view of the necessary uncertainty as to what exactly is meant by resolution. So he's saying that this isn't everything. It's just a, a rule that you might come up with. Um, but it's, um, you know, at the moment, actually, as I've defined it so far, this is actually quite restrictive. Uh, because it assumes that you've got a perfect imaging system, it assumes you've got circular apertures, it actually assumes you've got incoherent light. This is a Im very important thing. When Rayleigh first came up with this uh, concept, he was really thinking of, of telescopes, not microscopes. He was thinking of two stars. Uh, and if you've got two stars, uh, the light from two stars is obviously going to be... There's no phase coherence between the light between two stars. So, so they're basically incoherent with respect to each other, right? So if they're, if they're incoherent, you can add the intensities of the two points. Uh, so this was all assumed in, uh, in, in Rayleigh's uh, original uh, concept. Um, but in a microscope, that might not be true. You know, if you illuminate two points, you might illuminate them coherently. Uh, and then the resolution is going to depend on how you illuminate them. Uh, and uh, this is going to be one of the things I say quite a lot about in, the, in these lectures, is about how uh, the uh, resolution of a microscope is going to be affected uh, by uh, the coherence of the system. Uh, so how do we deal with this? To, to, to generalize this Rayleigh criterion so we can apply it in, in, in more general cases. Uh, and uh, so it's all based on this idea here. Um, we, we find, according to Rayleigh, uh, that the intensity for this special case, when it's a perfect imaging system, uh, incoherent illumination, uh, the intensity midway between the points, if you divide that uh, by the intensity at the points themselves, uh, this ratio is 0.735. This is the, how big the dip is that you see in that image of two points. Uh, and we take that uh, as, the, as our definition of resolution for the more general case. This is called the, the generalized uh, Rayleigh criterion. You'll find quite a lot of literature about, about this. Um, right, but first of all, let's say a bit more about this, uh, co this uh, incoherent case. Um, here I've plotted the image of two points, incoherent points, uh, and this, this one here is for the, the case where they just satisfy the Rayleigh separation. So this, the ratio between this and this is 0.735. Um, what happens if you make them slow, slightly closer together? What happens if you make them slightly further apart? Well, this is what I show here. This is 10% closer, 20% closer, 10% further apart, 20% further apart. So not a very big change in the distance between these points. You see that actually it changes very quickly, the shape of this image. Right? So although uh, I said that this, uh, you know, this, this, um, Rayleigh criterion was rather arbitrary, you see that it's about right. Uh, and, uh, you know, because a lot happens over a very small change in distance between the two points. Changing from 10% bigger to 10% smaller, you see the size of this dip changes appreciably. Right? So, um, so what that really means is that maybe if you'd, if you'd uh, change the resolution the actual details of the resolution by, to something different, uh, it wouldn't really give a very different result. Okay, now, uh, I said resolution depends on coherence. Uh, and this is all to do uh, with the illumination system of the microscope. 
Uh, and uh, so here I show a, a microscope. Uh, this is the objective lens, very simple this. Uh, and this is the condenser lens. So the sample is placed here. Uh, it's illuminated with light from the condenser lens uh, and produces an image in this plane here. Uh, so this, th th this picture here is taken from Born and Wolf again. This shows what's called critical illumination. I, 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 I've heard that uh, you, you, you've also heard about Kerner illumination system. Um, I think I'll, probably I'll say something about that in a minute. Uh, it doesn't really make a lot of difference from the point of view of the performance of the microscope uh, in, in terms of theoretical terms. Uh, but in this case here, you've got a condenser lens, and you see that this is illuminating the object uh, with light coming, if you think of it as being plane waves, they're plane waves coming in from different directions. Right? So uh, one of the important features is what is the aperture of this condenser lens. Uh, and the, con the aperture of the condenser lens is fixed uh, by this aperture stop. So any microscope would have a control that you can change to change uh, the aperture of the illumination system. Uh, and uh, so we change this, this iris diaphragm here. Uh, and if you stop this down, it will become a smaller aperture, obviously. Okay. Uh, and uh, so here I've written um, uh, alpha C, alpha O. The, uh, uh, so these are the angles. Alpha O is the, uh, is the angle, the semi-angle of the objective. This is what determines the numerical aperture of the objective lens. And alpha C is going to uh, determine the numerical aperture of the uh, condenser lens, right? Uh, and it turns out... The ratio between these is the important thing. Uh, and uh, sometimes we call this the coherence ratio. Uh, a lot of, a lot of um, sources uh, talk about this as being capital S. I think Born and Wolf call it capital S. Uh, you might find some other papers that call it different things. But this uh, coherence ratio is the ratio of the numerical aperture of the condenser to the numerical aperture of the objective. Uh, and basically, the, the coherence of the illumination, and therefore of the final image, uh, for the image formation, formation process, depends on this ratio. Uh, so if S equals zero, we're effectively just illuminating with a plane wave. It's when the numerical aperture of the condenser lens is very small. Uh, and so it's effectively coherently illuminated. Right? It's just illuminated with a plane wave. It's, you get this result if you shone a laser at your sample. Uh, then as we increase S, it becomes partially coherent. And as S tends to infinity, if we could really illuminate um, w w with an angles that were much bigger than the numerical aperture of the, object of the objective lens, it would tend to become incoherent illumination. Uh, and uh, now, very often you can't do that, of course, uh, because there's a limit to ha how big these angles can be. Al alpha here can't be any bigger than pi by two. Right? So if, al if alpha zero uh, has got some big, uh, compar you know, comparatively large value, there's no way that this can be much bigger than this. Right? So some of these, you, you can't really get into this regime if you've got a high numerical aperture objective lens. Uh, so S tends to infinity uh, is incoherent illumination. So you could apply uh, Rayleigh's uh, um, criterion directly to this case if you could achieve it in an experiment. Now, in between, there's a very important case uh, which people quite often use in practice is where S equals 1. When S equals 1, it means that this aperture is equal to this aperture. Note then, uh, this is the numerical apertures. So if this, is, if this is an oil immersion lens, this would have to be an oil immersion lens. Right? So if we, very often, if we want the ultimate resolution in a microscope, we have to oil immerse the condenser lens as well as the objective lens. Uh, and, um, yeah, uh, on the other hand, so this is, what, this is what happens if you've got what's called a transilluminated object. So you've got your object on a slide, 
You illuminate it, it could be in transmission, could be in reflection, but the, the, all, the, all this would apply for either case. Um, but, it, it, but it's illuminated from outside. It's, it's different from what you might call a self-luminous object. Uh, and um, like stars I was just describing in astronomy, the, the, a star is a self-luminous object. Uh, and uh, you can think of fluorescence as being like a self-luminous object too. Uh, the reason for that uh, is that if you've got a fluorescent object, fluorescent dye, for example, you illuminate it with light, uh, but the, the fluorescence is incoherent. And, and the reason for that is because, you, you remember that the, when, when you uh, excite fluorescence, you excite an electron from a lower level to a, an upper level, and then it hangs around, the electron hangs around in this upper level for maybe a nanosecond, which is many, many periods of light, right? So when it pops but down, the phase of the light is arbitrary, basically. Uh, so fluorescence uh, behaves as incoherent imaging. Uh, and uh, no, it's interesting to note, um, I'm going to talk a bit about ABBA's uh, resolution theory in a minute. Um, you know, th this was actually proposed before fluorescence microscopy had been thought of. Um, so not about 1910, the first fluorescence microscopy was done. So a lot later. Uh, but this idea uh, that um, illuminating by over a range of angles is going to give, um, could give inf effectively incoherence, was actually first described by Lord Rayleigh, uh, about 1890, I think it was. Okay, so, um, so let's now look at what happens to our imaging of two points as we change the aperture of the condenser lens. So I give three, three examples here. Uh, a small condenser, equal apertures, and a large condenser. So large condenser, it's incoherent. So this is, this is Rayleigh's case. Let's look at this one first. Uh, I've, I've shown here four curves. The one in blue, the curve in blue, is pretty close, actually, to being the uh, Rayleigh separation. It's, um, here is V equals two. It's, it's a really... Uh, 1.9 something, I think we said it was. Um, so this one, this one is close to being the Re uh, Rayleigh separation. So these two points are, are resolved. Let's go to this one now. This is the small condenser, coherent illumination, or close to coherent illumination. Uh, again, though, I've shown four curves here. The blue one here is the same separation as this one. What can you see? Here they're resolved, here they're not resolved, right? So, uh, so this is one thing um, that we've learned, which is a very important thing. Uh, if you stop down your condenser lens, the resolution's not so good. You open up the condenser lens, you get better resolution from the point of view of this two-point resolution, right? In between... Equal apertures is this blue curve. Actually, it turns out this blue curve is identical to this blue curve. Uh, however, uh, these other curves are different from these ones. So it turns out that the, res the, the Rayleigh resolution limit is the same, uh, but uh, what happens if we're not quite at the Rayleigh resolution limit is slightly different. Uh, and... Um, uh, I'm making a big point about this because there are very many papers that you, you, you read where they, they get this wrong. They think that this is incoherent illumination, and it's not. It's a partially coherent illumination. Um, and, um, but it just so happens that when the points, two points, are separated by this particular distance, you get the same image. Okay, so this is plotted uh, in uh, Bourne and Wolfe again. Uh, and he, th this is a picture I've taken from Bourne and Wolfe. Uh, this is this um, coherence ratio, S. Uh, and uh, so here you see he's got it going from zero up to two. Uh, this is the, the match condition in the middle here. Uh, and um, what he's plotting here 
is the, the, the distance between two points for them to be just resolved according to this generalized uh, Rayleigh criterion, this 0.735 ratio of intensities. Uh, and, uh, and this is what you get. You see that here this is coherent. The resolution is not so good. The distance between the points is further uh, apart. And then as you open the aperture, you see this decreases. Uh, it comes to a minimum. It comes to a minimum at this, where this S, this ratio, is about 1.4. Uh, and you see then it starts increasing. Eventually, it's going to tend to um, uh, 0.61. So actually, if you plotted this curve further, it would start oscillating like this and tend to 0.61 eventually. Uh, okay, and uh, should be, uh, yeah, that's right. So here, 0.61 is this point here as well. Two-point resolution. Right, so um, this is another way of, of, of um, presenting this information. What I've, what I've done is I've plotted here this ratio of the intensity midway between the points uh, to the intensity at the points themselves uh, as, a, as a function of the separation between the points. Uh, and uh, so for the incoherent case, let's, this is Rayleigh's case, is this curve here. You see it, it rises up and then drops down again and then it does, does some oscillations. Where this curve uh, crosses this 0.735 line corresponds to the two-point resolution for that microscope. Uh, for coherent illumination, you see it's this curve. And, and so the, the, uh, the resolution is poorer. The distance between the points is further apart uh, for the coherent case. So I show a few different ones here. I also show a couple of confocal ones. I'm going to talk a lot about confocal mic microscopes in the um, in later part of this, uh, um, these lectures. But you see that uh, confocal reflectance uh, or confocal fluorescence, uh, we're, in, we're, in, we're improving the, the two-point resolution. Right, so this is uh, what I've uh, talked about here, the generalized Rayleigh criterion. So you'll find that that is the, what they assume in many, many papers, uh, including Bourne and Wolfe. Uh, it's defined um, as the ratio between the intensity midway between the points uh, to, the, uh, to the intensity at the points themselves. Um, but actually, th 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 this actually, this definition does have a problem. Uh, from the point of view of actually measuring this, because you don't necessarily know where the points are. Uh, if you've got aberrations, for example, um, if you've got a system with aberrations, the magnification might not be very well determined. Right? So sometimes people uh, take the definition as being not the, uh, at the points, but the intensity at the maxima. So you get a dip surrounded by maxima, and you take that ratio instead. Um, so this has been called um, the, the modified Rayleigh criterion rather than the generalized Rayleigh criterion. Uh, so well, this is getting a bit detailed, really. But uh, th th this is by far the most used uh, um, expression that people use. Um, so there are some other things I mentioned here. I'm not even going to talk about that. I'll just confuse you. But I do have a, a bit of a discussion about these, uh, these different definitions in this paper. Uh, that um, resolu it, this, it, was, it was actually about solid immersion lens microscopes. Uh, and uh, so this is from uh, when I was in Singapore. Uh, so in, in Singapore, uh, so this is a paper by Rui, Rui Chen, who's still in Singapore, actually. I, in, when I was in Singapore, I was in... Um, the um, uh, National University of Singapore in the bioengineering department. Uh, and um, so this was uh, some work we were doing there um, on solid immersion lens microscopes. OK, so yeah, this is just pointing out uh, something that's going to be important in uh, t tomorrow's lecture, really. 
um, is that um, imagine you've got a, an object which is a phase object. Imagine your object can be described by this complex number. It, there's a modulus term and a phase term. Uh, and uh, so this is what we call the object transmission, transmission uh, or transmittance. Uh, and um, I wanted to point out that if you could produce a perfect image of this, if you had a perfect microscope, uh, what you would see is just the modular square of this, wouldn't you? And the modular square of this is just A squared. Right, so this is quite interesting, isn't it? Uh, it's a, this is a, a limitation of perfect imaging. If you've got a perfect imaging system, you don't see the phase. So maybe you want to see the phase. Uh, so uh, what this is su suggesting is that if you want to see the phase, the best thing is for it to not be a perfect imaging system. You have to mess it up in some way. Uh, and in lecture tomorrow, I'll talk about some different ways you can mess it up in order to make, it, make the phase visible. Okay, now, so what happens then? We've spoken about two points. Um, we can generalize that to more general objects. How can we calculate what the image is in these different types of system? First of all, we'll take the coherent case. Uh, let's imagine we've got two points. Uh, this is the image of one point. It's the amplitude image of one point, right? This is this, is this um, Bessel function thing, 2j1 of v over v. Uh, but we have to, because this is coherent, we have to add the amplitudes coherently. Here we're assuming that these two points uh, are, are, are um, uh, give, giving out light in phase with, with respect to each other, right? So we add, um, we add together the amplitudes of the two points, uh, and it gives this solid line here. This is still an amplitude. You see it goes negative. Uh, and then what we actually observe is the intensity. So we actually observe the modular square of this amplitude, which looks like this. So now this is our airy disk. Right? So uh, this is the airy disk for this. Uh, sorry, this is not the airy disk. This is the image of these two points. Sorry. Uh, but, it, but you see, there's, there's not a lot of indication that you've got two points there. Right? These are actually, um, I've chosen these two points to be uh, actually at the Rayleigh uh, distance. So this is the case where they, they would be resolved uh, if it was incoherent, um, but uh, not resolved if it's coherent. Okay, so we generalize that. That's two points. Um, how can we treat some arbitrary objects? This is our arbitrary object. We break it up into lots of points. We say each of these points is like a, uh, this 2j1 of v over v type curve. And uh, then we add all these two together. Uh, and then we have to do the modular square uh, to calculate the intensity. So this is our final expression. The image that you see, the image intensity, is the uh, amplitude point spread function, we call it, this shape of this curve, uh, convolved with the object's amplitude. So all this is saying is that for each point of the object, you have to place one of these, and then we add them all together. Uh, and then finally, we have to find the modular square in order to find the total intensity of that object. So this is how we can calculate uh, the image of an arbitrary object in a coherent system. Um, now, the other way of doing this is in, in, in Fourier space. Right, so um, we introduce uh, the, well, if it's a periodic object, uh, we can introduce the Fourier series for our object. Uh, so this gives you an example. Uh, imagine your object is, is, got, is a square wave grating like this. So bright and dark regions. Uh, we can resolve this uh, square wave object into its Fourier series. It consists of a constant term, a first harmonic, uh, a third harmonic. There's no second harmonic for this particular case because of the, the symmetry. Uh, and if we added together these first three components that I've just mentioned, constant, first harmonic, third harmonic, uh, 
sum them together, we get this. So, so you see, we're already getting something which looks quite reasonably close to our square wave objects. Right, so, uh, so this is a way of, um, another way of treating uh, uh, imaging in an in, in a optical system is in terms of the, uh, what we now call Fourier optics. It's interesting that, um, you know, Fourier optics really, I, in, in some ways, uh, was invented by Abba in, with his diffraction theory of the microscope. Um, but other people were not very happy with this idea at that time, uh, especially Lord Rayleigh, it seems, who, um, who, who didn't think it was a very good way of doing it. Um, you have to remember that Fourier transforms also were not really very well known at that time um, in, in the 1800s. Right? So uh, nowadays we feel very happy we're taking Fourier transforms all the time. So you don't need to use a Fourier series. You, you can use a Fourier transform. It, it doesn't have to be a periodic function anymore because we, we know we can still use Fourier transform. Uh, so the basic principle of Fourier optics uh, is that a lens produces, uh, performs a Fourier transform operation. So if you've got some amplitude in the front focal plane, a distance f in front of a lens, uh, then if you look in the back focal plane of the lens, the amplitude is going to be given by the Fourier transform of it. So this is our amplitude here. This is the Fourier transform of it. Uh, and um, optically, basically, what the Fourier transformation is doing uh, is changing uh, positions to slopes and slopes to positions. So here I'm showing some rays. Uh, this is at a particular radi um, distance from the axis. Uh, and uh, the lens converts this ray uh, to a particular slope, particular gradient. The further away it is from the axis, the bigger the slope. And vice versa, a slope is converted into position. Right? So this is um, our, our lens, Fourier transforms a, a signal. Uh, and uh, so this is showing it again. Here we've got some object. Uh, this is a lens. And if we look at the back focal plane of the lens, we will see the Fourier transform of this. As a simple example of that, what happens if we put our square wave grating here, or any form of grating? If we've got a grating, we illuminate it with light, uh, the light is going to be diffracted, isn't it? You'll get different diffraction orders. So the different diffraction orders will appear in this plane here. Right? So uh, the example I gave of a square wave grating has got a, 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 a constant component, which is going to appear at the origin. It's going to have a first harmonic, which is going to be somewhere out here, according to the spacing of the grating. And there'll be a third harmonic, a fifth, and so on, getting further and further away. Uh, and uh, Abba realized this. Uh, he realized this in, in 1850 or whenever it was. Very, very um, before its time, I think, really, to have... Uh, appreciated this idea back then. Uh, and um, he realized that then you can think of a microscope as being simply two of these, one after the other, two units. This is our sample. We take the Fourier transform. The second lens uh, takes another Fourier transform. The Fourier transform of a Fourier transform is actually the same as doing a Fourier transform and then an inverse Fourier transform, except that it flips over. This is why you get a, a negative image in, a, in, an, in an optical system. Uh, and um, so, uh, so the, here I show the object. This is the, the frequency content of the object. Uh, but the, of course, the aperture of the system is not infinitely large. Here I show this aperture stop. This is the aperture of the objective lens. This is the objective lens. This is the tube lens. Uh, here we I've drawn this like we normally do in Fourier optics books. This is what's sometimes called a 4F optical system. All these distances are F. Uh, but in, in a microscope, it's not a 4F system. 
because these two lenses would have a different focal length because you want to magnify. If you make the focal length of this bigger than this one, uh, then you get a magnified image. Uh, and um, so, anyway, we've got this aperture stop. So you see, this, this object has got this frequency content. Uh, and it goes on forever, maybe. Uh, and uh, so the further away from the axis corresponds to the finer detail in the object. And you see that this fine detail doesn't get through this aperture stop. Right? So only the part of this that goes through the aperture stop produce, is, is into the, goes into the final image. Uh, so this um, be, explains why a, a microscope has got a certain resolution and why it depends on the aperture of the lens. Uh, so nowadays, um, because of the, the way we think of in terms of Fourier optics as being you know, a bit like communications theory, we tend to, we tend to this, think of this as being a low-pass filter. The low frequencies are transmitted, uh, the high frequencies are not transmitted. And mathematically, uh, this is the way we write these things. This is our object transmittance that I mentioned before. Uh, we, this is uh, the Fourier transform of this. So this is uh, what we call the object spectrum. So this is the Fourier transform of this object. Uh, and then uh, that is going to be filtered uh, by some sort of transfer function, which is a description of that aperture any aberrations the system might have, or whatever. Uh, and we, de we describe this in terms of this um, C. I've written it here, C, M, N. So this is, this is our object. Uh, these M and N are spatial frequencies in the X and Y direction. We have to filter that by this, uh, what we call the coherent transfer function of the system. So once we've multiplied by that, uh, this tells us now the, the spatial frequencies which are in the image, uh, we then have to do an inverse Fourier transform to get back into real space, the second lens. And then finally, we have to do a modular square in order to calculate the intensity. Uh, and um, so this is the expression then. You can use this to calculate uh, the image of any arbitrary object in a coherent system. What happens if it's not a coherent system? Um, well, it turns out this, in, this, it, this modular square of this double integral, we can actually write as four integrals, which I've written in this next line here. So we just multiply this by its complex conjugate, which I've done here. Uh, and, and now we've got an integral over four spatial frequencies. Um, M and N are in X and Y directions. P and Q are also in the X and Y directions. Uh, I'm sorry for this terminology, but this was the way it was developed originally by Hopkins, and it's described like this in Born and Wolf 2. Uh, so M and P are two spatial frequencies uh, in uh, the X direction, both in the X direction. Uh, N and Q are two spatial frequencies both in the y direction. Uh, and you see, in the final image, you see what we get. We get m minus p. So basically, these, these, uh, these spatial frequencies mix. And this is because we're looking at intensity, not to do not uh, amplitude. Right? And uh, so, th so this is how we can write this expression again, expanding this as these four inter the two integrals as four. Uh, and you see here, we got this um, coherent transfer function appearing twice. Uh, it turns out, if you want to treat a partially coherent system, uh, then all you, this expression still works, except that these two things don't separate anymore. So you have to replace that product by some function of four spatial frequencies. Uh, and um, I'm not going to go into a lot of detail about how this is done. This is called the transmission cross coefficient. Uh, but as I say here, this is all complicated. It's probably more complicated than you really need to know. 
Let's go to the other simple case. Let's, let's the other uh, limiting case, incoherent illumination. Now what we've said is we have to add together the intensities rather than the amplitudes. Uh, and uh, so here we see, uh, we add together two airy disks, get the total. You see now there, it's nicely resolved. It's, this is at the Rayleigh separation again. And if we, if we generalize to many points, we think of our object here. This is now an intensity object. Uh, we, we break it up into lots of points. Each of these points is imaged like an airy disk. Then we add them all together, and we get the final intensity in the image. Right? So, so this is now our expression for the final image. Uh, it's the modulus square of the amplitude point spread function gives the intensity point spread function, the airy disk. Uh, and the modulus square of T gives the intensity transmission of your object. And you the convolution of these. Right? So just to um, compare that with um, what we had earlier. Uh, and um, right now, so let's say about the, uh, um, the, the, tr the, the spatial frequencies get, that get through for an incoherent system. It turns out... For a coherent system, if it's a perfect system, uh, the aperture stop tells you everything. The, the, the spatial frequencies inside the aperture stop get through. The spatial frequencies outside of the aperture stop don't get through. So we can, recognize, we can represent this as a circle. It turns out, uh, for the incoherent case, uh, what, what we call the optical transfer function, often called the OTF, is given by the, the um, autocorrelation of this circle. The autocorrelation of the circle, we have to move one of the circles relative to the other and calculate the area of overlap. If you calculate this, uh, you can actually express it analytically like this. Uh, and it looks like this. And this is sometimes called the, the Chinese hat function because of its shape. Right? So the, here I've tried to draw a three-dimensional view of what this looks like in 3D. Uh, if you've got a system with circular objectives, circular apertures and so on, uh, this has got circular uh, cylindrical symmetry. And if we do a cross-section through here, we get some curve that looks like this. So this is uh, the transfer function for an incoherent system. Uh, so these are, these are the two cases, the two limiting cases. Uh, you've got a coherent transfer function for an, a coherent system, an optical transfer function for an incoherent system. Um, you see that there's some differences between these. The first thing to note uh, is that the cutoff of this one is actually twice as big as this one. And I guess, uh, certainly to a first approximation anyway, uh, this is the reason why an inco incoherent system has got better resolution than, an than a coherent system. Because it's got twi whoops, sorry. Uh, twice the, the bandwidth. Right? On the other hand, maybe we can't really compare these two things. You know, I've put them on the same picture here, but they're not really the same. This one operates on amplitudes. This one operates on intensities, right? So you can't really compare them completely uh, one with the other for that reason. Uh, you notice the other thing is that this one slopes off. This one's got a flat top. This one decreases. Uh, so although this has got twice the bandwidth of this, you see that the, 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 the um, transfer function is actually dropping off. So these higher spatial frequencies are not actually imaged as strongly as, the, as um, the, the high spatial frequencies here. This, this again is another picture I took from uh, Born and Wolf, uh, but originally it was done by, uh, calculated by Harold Hopkins. Uh, and uh, what it shows here, this is the OTF I've just shown you for an incoherent system. These other curves here correspond to, to different amounts of defocus. As you defocus the system, so the, you see the, 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 these curves start falling off. It means that the, 
spatial frequencies are not transmitted as well by the optical system. So this explains very simply why, if you defocus your opt optical system, the image isn't as good, right? Because the spatial frequencies don't get transmitted as well. Um, th there's a very interesting thing about this, though, that maybe you can't see too well. If, if you look at this axis here, this is the origin. This is zero here. Uh, and so these are positive uh, quantities. This is actually going negative. So this OTF, although if it's in focus, is, is always positive, uh, if there's defocus, it actually starts going negative. Uh, and um, this is really bad news. If you think in terms of that square wave grating, you know, uh, we, we resolved it into its Fourier, tra uh, Fourier, uh, Fourier components. Uh, what this would mean is that some of them get reversed in sign. Right? If, you, if the value of the OTF is negative, it means that that component is flipped over. So it's not going to produce the right sort of result at all in that case. Uh, and um, so I've got an example of this. Um, this is actually not for the incoherent case. This is, this is actually for this case S equals 1. Uh, but these, these are, are some calculations done by uh, one of my former students from Singapore, Shalin Mehta. Uh, so he's now at um, Marine Biological Labs uh, in Woods Hole. Uh, and uh, so he calculated images of this um, Zeeman star, it's called. Uh, the Zeeman star, you see, is like a square wave grating as you go around, uh, but the, the period of it gets higher at the closer you get to the centre. Uh, and so this is the in-focus image. Uh, this is a defocused image. This is another defocused image. Uh, and I hope you can see what, what this sign change can do. This is the defocused image. You see that what, what, um, what was... What, uh, bright becomes dark. What was dark becomes bright. So you actually get a contrast reversal. Right? So um, obviously this is not a good thing if you want to get an image which tells you exactly what your object looks like. Okay, so this um, uh, is taken from uh, one of Shalin's papers. You see it's in Biomedical Optics Express. Uh, and uh, he's, I think he's got this program he calls Microlith that you can download from somewhere for free, and it will calculate uh, partially coherent images for you. Another object uh, is a, a straight edge. Let's say you put a razor blade in your microscope. You look at the edge of the microscope. On one side, you're going to see bright. On the other side, you're going to see dark. But, of course, it doesn't change suddenly from dark to bright because of the resolution of the microscope. Uh, and uh, so these are some experimental uh, plots uh, that were published a long, long time ago now by this guy, Wotrazovitz. Uh, two different values of this coherence ratio uh, showing what the image of this edge looks like. Uh, and actually, is one interesting thing. This is S equals 1. Um, you see that um, actually at the edge, if you normalize this so that it's tending to one, uh, actually at the edge, the intensity is a third. It's a, it always um, amazed me why it should be a third. Uh, and there have been a few papers actually published that prove that it's a third. Uh, but it's not trivial to prove it by any means. Um, if it was incoherent, then it would be a quarter. Uh, because... By symmetry, if you've got a, an edge like this, the amplitude actually at the edge would have to be a half, and therefore the intensity would have to be a quarter. Uh, if it's purely coherent, uh, sorry, I've got it around the wrong way. Um, for, if it's coherent, it's a quarter. A half squared gives, gives a quarter. If it's incoherent, it's a half. So um, in the experiment, he, he, he just did these two values. So here you can see it's, it's tending towards, well, it's not much, actually much different from a third there. But it, it um, let's see what it is. Uh, yeah, it's not far off a quarter. This is 50% this is here. 
Um, so it changes from a quarter up to a half as you change the aperture of the condenser lens. The other thing you'll notice here uh, is that if it's coherent illumination, you get this quite large overshoot. Fringes. Here you don't see fringes. So that's another difference. And this is actually often used in practice in the semiconductor industry. Uh, if, they're, if they're trying to measure the width of lines, features, uh, integrated circuit, uh, they use close to coherent case uh, because it turns out that this is actually steeper than this. So this, this is an example uh, where coherent is actually better than incoherent. The steepness of this transition region is, is greater for the coherent case than the incoherent case. So some of these things are, are, are um, I've um, summed them up here. The intensity at the edge for these three cases, the slope at the edge, you can calculate what that is and it comes to this. Uh, and um, so, as I say, for these particular examples when you're measuring the size of things, uh, people have found that nearly coherent systems have, have got some advantage. Right, I think that's going to be the last slide. Right, so, um, so that's the first part of my lecture. I was going to do a bit more today, but maybe we'll have a five-minute break so that people can, and I can get my senses as well, before I carry on. And uh, so, so let's break for five minutes, and then I'll carry on and talk a bit about confocal microscopy. It's time yeah. for questions. Oh, yeah, I'll, I'll, of course. Yeah, either now or, or, yeah, please. Uh, and your uh, you uh, investigate uh, this parameter yeah. for different uh, system optical system, and uh, I don't know why you uh, call it uh, coherency because, uh, as we know, coherency is related to wave optics and uh, related to a phase difference between uh, different objects. Uh, I think uh, it's just uh, <coughs> a, 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 a comparison between two numerical aperture. Uh, am I correct or not? Thanks. Uh, uh, yes, you are correct. That you know this is just one very small part of it, uh, and uh, so actually um, the you know I, I shall say a bit more about partially coherent imaging tomorrow. Uh, I think this was actually the big missing link that, that was, you know, while uh, Abba came up with his theory and uh, everyone was arguing with him and not understanding quite what was going on, part of the problem was that nobody know, knew at that time how to treat partially coherent systems. Uh, and all this was solved eventually by Harold Hopkins again, actually, who I just mentioned, uh, who... Um, uh, did an amazing amount of uh, uh, really, you know, high quality work on diffraction imaging. Uh, and he came up with the idea, you know, basically he calculated this system uh, by, uh, in terms of what you're saying about the, the wave theory of partial coherence, you can propagate the, uh, the mutual uh, coherence through the optical system. And that's what he did in his paper, 1953, I think it was. So you, 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 you propagate the, the partial coherence through the system, the mutual intensity, uh, and, uh, and then finally you get an expression uh, for the mutual intensity of the image, uh, and then from that you can calculate the intensity of the image. Uh, and um, so, yeah, yeah you're, you're right. So basically what happens is... Um, if you've got a uh, condenser lens which has got a certain aperture, let's say it's got a cir circular aperture, uh, then the uh, mutual in uh, intensity of the illumination is given by the Fourier transform of that, which is, again, this 2J1 of V over V. So that means that 
um, if you've got a two-point object, if you are imaging this point, the coherence of this point is going to depend on the aperture of the condenser lens. So that's how it all connects. Uh, but I think you'd have to read the papers to, to fully understand this. Yeah, okay, so, so what I'm saying is that this, uh, this, this mutual intensity of the illumination is given by the Fourier transform of the condenser lens, uh, and the width of that curve is going to be, again, a Bessel function. Uh, the, 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 the scale of it is determined by uh, the aperture of the illumination system. So this is why, this is where the aperture of the illumination system comes in. And the important thing is how big it is compared with the numerical aperture uh, of the objective lens. Right, so this, th this ratio determines how, how broad uh, the mutual intensity function is at the sample compared uh, with how big the point spread function of the system is. Okay, I mean, uh, the, this is uh, a uh, power... Uh, 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 white light uh, illumination, not uh, laser it's illumination. It's incoherent yeah? illumination, yeah, but, but, but uh, let's call it um, quasi-monochromatic. <laughs> yeah, I'm assuming a particular, well, uh, in, in the results I showed, we're all done for a particular wavelength. Not, we're not taking color into account, uh, but, it, but it's from a, it, 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 it's, let's say, filtered white light. So, you know, what you might have from a halogen lamp or a tungsten lamp with a filter. Not a laser. Yeah, this is not a laser in this case. It's, a, uh, it, it's, a, it's either a tungsten lamp or a, a, or a halogen lamp. Or an arc source, or something like this. So it assumes that, uh, I haven't really said this, yeah. Uh, so this source here is basically, according to uh, Hopkins' theory, this source is incoherent. Uh, and I, I think you know that as light propagates, uh, the, the coherence increases. Uh, and uh, so although the light, when, when it comes from the source, is purely incoherent, by the time it gets to here, it's actually partially coherent. So please read, and actually, uh, I will say a bit more about that. Uh, you can read it in Born and Wolf, uh, but I find the account in Born and Wolf very difficult. Uh, it's much better to go back to Hopkins' original paper, uh, where uh, I think it was in the Proceedings of Royal Society, uh, where he describes it in a much clearer way, I think. Okay, any more questions? Yes. Here. Hello, and thank you for your informative lecture. It's for, for, it was for, uh, so nice. And, uh, I guess uh, um, he was asking about the temporary and the special uh, coherency, and uh, I guess you were talking uh, about the special... Spatial coherence. Yes, yeah. coherency. And the other question is, um, is there any difference between the objectives in a, a reflective uh, microscopy and transmittive uh, microscopy or not? Uh, so the question is, are the objectives for transmission and reflection microscopy different? Um, the biggest difference is to do with this co uh, cover slip. You know, because biological ones are normally corrected for a cover slip, uh, whereas ones for d looking at metal surfaces and so on don't, are not corrected for a cover slip. Uh, but apart from that, they, they, they should be pretty much the same. Um. Just another one. You said that the, the perfect uh, object image is that we don't see the face. 
yeah but what do you mean by did we don't mm, see the face for example if we have a coherency a full coherence special and temporary we will see the fernal diffraction regions so it will maybe it uh, will uh, show the phases or, or you mean something else uh, yeah, okay. So, so I guess the question there is saying, pointing out that, that actually diffraction does depend on the phase. And yes, that's true. No, uh, no, I mean, uh, what do you, you know, when uh, we, we have an image, so it will, about the amplitude, not the uh, phase, but uh, we can um, measure the phase with holography fringes yeah, or other yeah, fringes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah, so of course, if you, if you have a, some sort of reference beam, then you can measure the phase. Uh, if you have a microscope without a reference beam, uh, then if it's a perfect microscope, you won't see the phase. Uh, on, in the talk tomorrow, I shall talk about how you can see the phase even without having interference. Yeah, so. Thank you. Okay. Is there room for another question? Yeah. So sorry. Thank you for the nice presentation, sir. Uh, my question was firstly about where you have uh, defined that in the coherent imaging, we add the amplitudes. So uh, by amplitude, do you mean the complex amplitude? Do you mean you uh, also add the phase, phases of the yeah, objects? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. What I saw there was that you added the curves, which was the real part, of it, uh, the absolute value of the amplitude. So... Uh, we assume that the phases on that image. Do uh, not... Well, the, yeah, okay. Uh, uh, first of all, yes, you're correct. You add the complex amplitudes, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, oh, sorry, I seem to not be connected to this anymore. Um, I think I. Oh no, it's it is there. Hold on. Can't find my cursor. Sorry, I've lost my cursor. I can't. <laughs> um, maybe I'll just have to say it in words. Um, the example I gave of two, uh, I, I gave an example of two points. Sure. Or, or maybe more, many points. But if you've got two points, each point is going to be like a, uh, a 2J1 of V over V, which is purely real. It goes negative, oh, yes, but yes. it's oh, real. Yeah, that, that's right. Yeah. That's so true. for that's the true. particular picture I drew, it just happens to be real. real. Yeah, but in general, as you say, you have to add phase them should, in, yeah. uh, in phase. And if it's not a uh, bad time, I have a very simple uh, short question about the reflective that uh, Pega mentioned. Uh, in the reflective microscopy, as long as I think, and I... I, I hope I'm not wrong, the condenser and the objective lens are the same. I mean, the same thing that condenses the light is the oh, same yeah. thing that sees the light. So it would be very sensitive to tilt. Isn't there any kind of objective which kind of is ready to correct this tilt aberration by itself? Because sometimes the object is not finely, you know, in detail to be corrected by the tilt. But the light doesn't go back to objective simply the, the way it was illuminated. Uh... I don't know of anything that's quite like that. Uh, so, you know, so in a reflection microscope, as you say, often you're using the same lens uh, to you know, uh, illuminate the sample and also to collect the light. Uh, and so that optical system will, will have a, a plane of focus, sure. uh, which is perpendicular to the axis. And you're saying that that might not coincide with your surface. So, um, uh, you know, sometimes, of course, um, so, some microscopes do have very sensitive tilt, ch tilt stages in order to correct for, the, for these angles. Uh, but I don't know offhand of any optical way of doing that. Handling. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Uh, hi. Uh, in some of uh, microscopy methods, based on uh, radiation of the sample, for example, fluorescence microscopy or Raman microscopy, uh, 
the radiation is direction dependent, and I think we have to define a modified uh, currents ratio. Is it correct? Uh, probably yes. Uh, so uh, uh, it's uh, I think uh, the sample dependent uh, for uh, image formation. Well, you know, it, it, in fluorescence, actually, of course, the light f in fluorescence is incoherent, full stop. So you know, the the details about the source are really not very important oh. in determining the the coherence, oh. um, right? So uh, because it's only the intensity of the light that matters. Uh, so I guess the same would be true in, in uh, Raman, ordinary Raman. Yeah. Thank you. So this afternoon, you'll have the chance to keep in maintaining these questions with Professor Colin Shepard because he's going to be in the lab. And this afternoon, uh, some of you, you are going to make the Abe diffraction experiment, which is what he was explaining right now, and the other group, you're going to, to study some aspects on microscopy. So this is quite a very important lecture. Okay, uh, thanks. Okay, so should we just carry on now, or do you want to have a break? What do people want to do? I'll continue for 20 minutes. Yeah, that's a good idea. Okay, right, so I'm going to uh, ch change uh, gear a little and talk about uh, confocal microscopy and a bit about super resolution. Uh, and um, so, so this, lect th this lecture I shall start now uh, and uh, carry on with it tomorrow before I then go on finally to phase contrast. So, so mainly I'm, in this lecture I'm going to be talking about, a lot of it is to do with fluorescence imaging uh, rather than uh, uh, um, bright field and, and um, so we don't have to think about coherence too much. Okay. Um, yeah, so I, first of all, I wanted to introduce the fact that there are actually two fundamentally different ways of producing an image. Uh, the first is what you do in an ordinary microscope. Uh, and um, so here I've called it imaging using a detector array. Uh, so nowadays, of course, we very often don't bother with an eyepiece. We just have some detector. We... we uh, um, record the image, store it in a computer, and so on. Uh, so this shows how um, an ordinary image is formed. So here I've got some object. Uh, this is the image, a magnified image. Uh, it's inverted, as I was saying earlier. Uh, and we can record that image using some detector array. Uh, but that's not the, the only way you, you can make an image. Uh, the other way is to use a scanning system. And interestingly, I, I think the, um, this was really first done with electrons before it was done with light for some strange reason. Uh, and um, anyway, so it's, th this is how it's, it's done, how an image is formed in a scanning electron microscope, but also in a scanning laser microscope. Uh, and um, so what you do is you have some source. Uh, it's effectively a, a, a point source. So here I've, got, I've limited the size of this so that it's very small. And we use a lens uh, to produce a probe of light. And then we scan that probe of light over our object. And we pick up some signal. Here I've just shown a detector picking up uh, a, a, a signal. And we see how that signal changes as we scan the light. And this gives us an image. Uh, here I show this, this, this intensity that the signal we measure is shown on, a, on a, to some sort of TV display. Um, now, it's quite interesting. This is uh, actually, probably, this, was, this method was first thought about in optics. This is actually the principle uh, of John Logie Baird's first television system. 
that he developed in 1920 something, 1928 I think. Uh, it was based on this method. Uh, th this whole idea has recently uh, been sort of reinvented, and it's called been called the single pixel camera, uh, which is a very fancy th name you have to call something if you want it published in physical review letters. Uh, but actually, all you're doing is talking about something that was really done in 1928. Uh, that's me being cynical. Uh, but anyway, you've got this single element detector uh, that allows you to record an image by doing this scanning. Uh, and um, it's quite interesting that there are these two different ways of producing an image there. Um, yeah, I've got a couple of points here. Uh, the detector doesn't image, it only collects light. Uh, and the magnification of the image is just given by the size of the scan compared with the size of the display. So that doesn't depend on the numerical aperture of the lens. The resolution does, but the magnification doesn't. Uh, whereas in a, a microscope, an ordinary imaging system, uh, the, the two are linked. Usually a high numerical aperture lens has got a higher magnification. Right, so doing this, um, Scanning with this focus probe allows you to do lots of interesting things. Um, you can produce an image, as I've just described, but you can actually use this illumination spot to produce all sorts of different other effects. Uh, so these are one, one sort of uh, experiments we were doing a very long time ago. This is back when I was in Oxford. Uh, and this is looking at semiconductor. Uh, this is a reflection mode. This is what we call the photovoltage mode. Illuminating with the focus spot of light produces, induces a voltage. You can measure the voltage. You scan your sample, you get an image of your sample, which is not an ordinary image now because it tells you something about the electrical properties of the sample. This is another one. Uh, this is a transistor. Uh, and you see these, these black lines? This is, this is done in an optical beam-induced current mode, it's called. OBIC, it's sometimes called. Uh, these black lines are defects in the, in the, in the crystal, the silicon. A stacking force, actually. Uh, you don't see these in an ordinary image, but by, by using this special way, you can, you can do that. So this is just, uh, you know, there are many, many different types of different contrasts you can pick up according to different signals you can pick up. In fact, any sort of, um, you know, physical or chemical type uh, interaction could be used as the basis uh, of producing an image. Spectroscopy, of course, is something uh, that we very often use uh, to do spectroscopic uh, images. Um, this was from a, a, another a paper I had when I was in Oxford. Uh, with my student Ingemar Cox, uh, who um, at that time there was a lot of interest in the acoustic microscope, where you use sound waves rather than light, uh, but also in the photoacoustic microscope, uh, where uh, you use uh, a um, uh, modulated light beam to induce an acoustic wave. Uh, this has also become very, very popular nowadays, actually. Uh, but the, it first started back in the, if this was 1984, I guess in around 1980, people were first doing experiments on this. Uh, and, um, but now you've got, um, you know, you might have a few different stages in this process. The light beam uh, produces uh, acoustic waves. Uh, actually, what it does, you see, is it heats up the sample. You have a modulated light beam. It periodically heats up the sample, so it produces thermal waves. And then these thermal waves uh, induce acoustic waves. So it all becomes a very complicated process altogether. Uh, and um, it gives you some idea that, that you can um, investigate the thermal properties, the acoustic properties, or in this case, the electronic properties and so on. Right, now, let's go back now to uh, these two types of microscope. An ordinary microscope and a scanning microscope. Which one gives the better resolution? Um, it turns out 
that under most circumstances, they both give exactly the same resolution. Uh, and there was, if you look in the literature, you'll see there was a lot of arguments about this. Uh, this all, well, ma mainly it started uh, when, for the, from the electron microscope field, uh, when the scanning transmission electron microscope was invented. Uh, and um, so people thought, is this going to give a better resolution than a transmission electron microscope or not? Uh, and eventually it was shown that they give exactly the same. It's called the equivalence theorem, the equivalence of scanning and conventional microscope. And it's based on the principle of reciprocity, which means that effectively you can reverse the rays uh, in, your, uh, in, in your ray diagram of the optical system. Uh, and this, this is going to hold, uh, it holds even if there's loss or multiple scattering, uh, but not inelastic scattering. So it won't work for fluorescence, for example, because if you've got an ordinary system, uh, you, you, you actually image the fluorescent light, which, as you know, has got a longer wavelength than the incident light. In a, in a scanning system, the resolution is determined by the wavelength of the illuminating light. So there, they're not going to be equivalent. This is a, a series, a, a whole list of papers where people have discussed these, these things. The first one's all for electron microscopes. Right, so I said you can re just reverse the rays. So let's just say a bit more about that. Uh, this is a, a, a conventional microscope. Here again, I've shown this as, as critical illumination. Um, but basically, you've got these two lenses, the condenser lens and the objective lens. Uh, here I'm showing uh, having some sort of detection system where you measure the image. Here I'm showing it by scanning a, a, a very small detector around in this plane, but it might be a CCD detector producing the image. This is a scanning system. Uh, and I want you to compare these two ray diagrams. You see that they look very similar except that one is inverted respect to the other. Here, you've got a large area source and a point detector. Here, you've got a point source and a large area detector. If you change the direction of all these rays, you get this, go from this one to this one. So the equiv equivalence theorem, which is based on reciprocity, says that this microscope and this microscope will get, give exactly the same resolution. As long as you, of course, this, this, uh, this objective lens here, the aperture of this has to be equal to the object, uh, uh, aperture of this first lens here, which you might call the probe-forming lens. There's another diagram I've got on this, on this plot here, this slide, and this shows a confocal microscope. This is not the same as either of these. It's got a point source and a point detector. Uh, and it turns out that the imaging properties of this system are completely different from either of these. These are the same as each other, but this is different from them. Uh, and um, it turns out that here, you see, is this second objective, which is primarily giving the numerical aperture of the system. It's responsible for determining the resolution. To a secondary degree, it does also depend on the condenser lens, but it's primarily the objective lens. Here, it's the first lens. Here, it's both lenses. Because we focus a spot of light onto the sample, uh, and this detector is only collecting light, which comes from a very small spot here. It turns out the overall e effect of this is that you have to multiply these two point spread functions together. And you end up getting uh, a, a, an improved resolution, slightly improved resolution as a result of that. So, um, so this is a confocal microscope, normally done in reflection mode. Light from a laser focused onto the sample. The light comes from the sample. It might be reflected light or it might be fluorescent light. Uh, is, is refocused onto a detector, but we put this small pinhole in front of the detector. And probably the most important property of the confocal microscope uh, is that the light which is coming from 
other planes of the sample, let's say the light from here is going to come to a focus here. Light from here is going to come to a focus further away. So only light from this focal plane of the system comes to a focus where the pinhole is. Right? So the light that comes from other regions won't get through the pinhole nearly so well. So we, we produce what we call optical sectioning. If we've got a thick object, we can look at the light that just comes from this plane. Uh, so, so this is the confocal microscope. Of course, at the moment, we've just looked at one point, as I've described it here. We have to build up an image by scanning. Uh, and in practice, we can usually we scan the beam using Galvo mirrors or something like that. Uh, but you can scan the sample, you can scan the lens. You have to scan something, anyway. And it's, it's done in reflectance or reflection microscopy, microscopy or in fluorescence. Mostly in fluorescence now, because this has become very, very useful uh, in uh, biological studies. Um, I show here the, the, the covers of, t of two books that uh, I've written about this method over many years. So this one, 1984, um, back from Oxford days. Uh, so, so this one was written with Tony Wilson, who was one of my students when I was in Oxford. He's still there. Uh, this is a later book, also written while I was in Oxford, actually, uh, but... Uh, uh, but published eventually after I'd left and gone to Australia. Uh, and this was written jointly with uh, David Shotton, uh, who was in the zoology department at Oxford. This one is a, a pretty theoretical book uh, that describes the theory of the imaging in different types of microscope and so on. Uh, this one is much more of a book for the user uh, and uh, describes different systems uh, how you should use it, and some examples of some images. Right, optical sectioning. Uh, this is a demonstration of optical sectioning. Uh, and um, all we're looking at here is uh, the surface of, a, of an integrated circuit. Uh, so this reminds me of this question about the... Uh, because this, this, this is very typically to do with this, actually. Uh, you see, this is uh, two pictures here of this integrated circuit. Uh, this is with the pinhole. This is with the pinhole removed. Without the pinhole there, we collect all the light. There's no optical sectioning. With the pinhole there, we get optical sectioning. We only get a, a signal from the part of the object which is in focus. So here, here and here, uh, the object is either too close or too far. Uh, so we just image this band like this. It, without the pinhole, this is what, what we get. Um, now, if you look very closely at this region, I don't think you can see this on this uh, display here, but you would find that this, this region here and this region here are blurred because they're out of focus. The region in the stripe across here would be a better focus. You can't really see that. Uh, so this, I think, was the, the first real demonstration of, of optical sectioning in a confocal microscope, uh, shown in um, a paper in Optics Letters, 1981. Uh, so, yeah, we, um, optical sectioning, we sometimes call it depth discrimination. So these are almost uh, analogous terms. So, confocal microscope, the advantages, uh, optical sectioning... There's, there's two main ways you can use that. You can look at a, th a thick object, uh, and uh, you can look at sections through a thick object, like tissue, uh, or you can look at a surface, and you can actually measure the height of the surface. Uh, and um, related to that is another uh, effect, uh, reduced scattered light, because this pinhole as well as getting rid of light that comes from the wrong part of the sample, is also going to get rid of light that comes from anywhere else. So if light reflects inside the system or from other parts of the sample, uh, this scattered light is going to be removed by the pinhole. Uh, so that means that if you're looking, say, at some biological tissue, you can look deeper into the biological tissue. Uh, and the third advantage, improved resolution. Uh, 
Um, it's, I mentioned this already. It's quite interesting. This is what was driving us to do this in the first place when we uh, built these systems back in the, the 1970s and 1980s. Uh, but it turned out that optical sectioning was what was the important thing. Um, the resolution point of view um, really went away. And then eventually, um, people came back to it again with the structured illumination microscope, which I sh shall talk about uh, later on. Uh, but, um, but now it's going full circle, and we're coming back to thinking about resolution in confocals again, and I'll say more about that uh, tomorrow, it will be. Uh, right, so reflection methods, fluorescence methods. Reflection uh, you can use for various industrial applications, looking at semiconductors, manufactured items, surface profiling. Uh, more recently, it's also now being used for some uh, biomedical type applications, looking for skin cancer uh, and so on. Uh, but in the bio area, nearly always it's done in a fluorescence mode. Uh, and uh, we either use autofluorescence from the sample itself or we label it with some fluorescent marker. Uh, and, uh, and we can look at fixed samples or we can look, look at living samples. And now we've really got to, you know, why the confocal microscope has become so important. You can look at living samples. Uh, and whereas, you know, electron microscope has got much higher resolution, but you have to kill it, chop it up, slice it, put it in a vacuum, coat it in metal, or do all sorts of nasty things to it. It's certainly not living by then, right? So in, in confocal microscope, you can look at living things. I might mention one other thing about this, the um, industrial applications. I was once told by someone from Zeiss, Zeiss of course is one of the, manu the main manufacturers of confocal microscopes. Uh, this guy from Zeiss told me they have sold more confocal microscopes for industrial applications than they have for biomedical applications. So it's huge. Every company has got one to look at the surface of something that they've manufactured, uh, to, you know, fault finding. Uh, so there's, there, there's been tens of thousands of them sold. So um, this is an example of uh, surface profiling. Uh, I've got two images here. Uh, we call this one an autofocus image, this one a surface profile image. What we do is we, we move the sample axially until we get the maximum signal. We record the maximum signal and how far we've moved it. How far we've moved it corresponds to the height of the sample, right? So bright means closer to you. Black means further away from you. Uh, this one, though, is an autofocus image. Every point on there is brought to the best focus. So the depth of focus of this system uh, is much, much more than you can get with an ordinary microscope. It's, it's, it's in principle unlimited, except that eventually you bump into the lens. Right? Here, you, th these heights you can't see very well because of the dynamic range of the system. But we can record these two images directly into, the, into, the, into a computer. We can then process those images. Um, so this, uh, this is the surface profile. So this is, this, is, this is actually calculated from these two images. Uh, nowadays, the way we, when we first did this, it, we would do it like that. We would record these two images and then calculate that. Nowadays, computers are so big, now you would record a complete three-dimensional image, then you can, rec you can get this from them or this from them or anything, right? But in the early days, we couldn't do that because our computers weren't big enough. Uh, but now you can see this surface. Uh, this is a, a, a bonding pad on the surface of the sample. This is silicon. Uh, this is aluminium. This, that's why this is brighter than this, because it reflects better. Uh, and you can see the, the, the height of this sample and so on. Uh, so that's an example of uh, auto um, autofocus and surface profiling. Right, I think I'd better stop at that point. Uh, and uh, tomorrow I'll, I'll carry on with how can focal microscopes work from a theoretical point of view.
Uh, and then more recent developments uh, in terms of super resolution and so on. Well, thank you very much, Professor Shepard. Okay, so we have now break, lunch break uh, with uh, one hour and health. So uh, please be here on time for the uh, afternoon lecture. Thank you. I ought to ask if there are any questions now, or, but or we could, we could save uh, it till later. We could continue the discussion this afternoon in the lab.